welcome. Um, my name is Bill Miller. I'm the former director of the Creative Writing Program at George Mason University. And my guest today is Susan Shreve, a novelist and uh, my colleague for much of my time as the director of the program. And um, we are celebrating many things today, the 40th anniversary of the program, as well as Susan's retirement from the program. Effective, I guess, this, this fall. Susan, is that, yeah? First year and, of not teaching. Yeah. I was a girl. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and also we're going to be talking about her, her most recent book, More News Tomorrow. Um, if you don't have a copy, um, you can order one uh, through a link um, that's available to you um, through the bookstore One More Page. Um, I'll mention this as we, as we go along. Um, Susan, 40 years of a creative writing program is a long time, and you were there for four years before it even got started. Um, that's a long time to sort of put up with the bureaucracy of a growing university that was under-resourced at the beginning and kept underpaying people and kept bringing in students and expanding. Um, I talk about, about Mason, which I won't get sidetracked with, with that through my years of its growth and, and, and whatnot. But, but you were there for a little bit longer than I was and put up with it. Um, but tell us, how did you come to be at Mason and um, what, was, what was it like being there? Uh, I came to be at Mason. I had a job. Uh, it was 1976. I had a job at a high school, a private high school in Washington. And my husband and um, I were fired in the same week. I was fired from my job because some man who was an English teacher had come in and said he'd like a job. I had a contract for that job, but they gave it to the man. And so I no longer had a job. That was easy to do now, then. It would not be easy to do now. And so I was without a job. Porter was out without out a job, and we had four small children. And then I got a call the following day from someone named Myra Sclerou, who is a poet. She said, I just went out to George Mason from Washington, D.C. They offered me a job. I'm not going to take it. It's too far. Would you like it? And so I said, yes. I went out for the interview the following day and was hired. There were three people who interviewed me. I was hired as an assistant professor. Hmm. And so that is how I began. I did that for one year teaching a 5-5 load with very, very small salaries, as you say, we received at that time. And then I got a year off grant to teach at GW. And in that year off, I took, taught a 2-2 load at much more salary. And I went back to George Mason the following year and spoke to Dick Bausch, who was teaching there at the time and the only other writer, and said, let's start an MFA. He had an MFA, I did not. And so I went about going to interview people all over uh, the country on MFAs, how to do it, how it was best. There weren't that many of them to interview. And came back and asked the chairman of the department if we could have an MFA, and he said, certainly. Asked the president, who said, certainly. And that's what bureaucracy was in those days. <laughs> the following year, we had an MFA. Well, and I can't believe how easy that bureaucratic non-fight was. Um, but for those who, who aren't familiar with it, M Mason did have an MA program uh, with several tracks, including one in creative writing. So there was some precedent. And there were a lot of students who came through that track, and I was very impressed with them. Right. W what impressed you about them? Uh, the reality of them. They were living in suburban Virginia. They were working very hard. They had to pay for their own education. Uh, they were living real lives. There was nothing precious about it. And, um, and therefore, they had had interesting things happen in their lives. 
And of course, that is um, the history of the sort of organic nature of really good graduate creative writing programs. The, yeah. the, the students, usually the best students, the most promising, most successful, really did have something to write out of. Uh, of course, this is rooted in uh, veterans returning from World War II, um, but the growth, of course, was exponential and beyond just those veterans, but it, it really found its its best core when, when there were students, there was a population either brought in or already there of, of writers, uh, potential writers and, and people already starting to feel their way along as writers who, who had that kind of uh, experience out of which to write. Um, and I always told people who expressed an interest in Mason's program, that, that we had that and that we had the faculty, um, you and Dick and Steve and, um, and others, uh, who could nurture that kind, of, that kind of capability and that kind of not find the Mason way, but find for each writer the, the way to tell his or her own story or poem or, or essay. Um, but I think the other thing that the Mason program has done tremendously well at for 40, its 40 years um, is community, building community and, and bringing people in. Um, and, I, and I see this as a kind of a hallmark of the program, particularly now when there's been an exponential growth in low res and no res programs. Um, and that is those programs that re do not require you to come and live in community. And of course with COVID, um, which has us here staring at our computers and each other on screens um, and hoping we have audience members out there who are looking back at us, but we can't see them. Um, but that's, of course, changing a lot of classes to um, virtual classes rather than, than actual communal classes. Um, do you think that we're in a, in a change period? Um, and I ask you this question because you have always, always been a person with her fingers on the pulse of what's happening in uh, creative writing education as well as the literary world and kind of melding those two together. Um, I think through the, through the decades that you've been teaching, um, that's been a, a real trademark of, of what you bring to the discussion. So I'm interested in your insights. Well, I'm, I'm very interested in what's happening with MFAs and what's happening with writing programs, with our writing program in particular, because when MFAs started was really when the magazine industry was no longer publishing uh, as much fiction. They took care of fiction writers and somebody had to take care of fiction writers when, when uh, the magazines stopped and it was MFAs. We became teachers. I don't have a PhD. I don't even have an MFA, but I had written books. And so um, we became teachers and it became a profession for us. We didn't come first. Um, the students' desire for creative writing came first. I think that writing is a way of, if, if you never write a book, it is a way of figuring out the way you think. It's a way of understanding yourself and others. It's a way of communicating. And you mentioned something else there, which would never happen in a much more sophisticated university that we have now become. But in those days, we were cowboys. And, um, and every one of the first four writers at George Mason who remained to be become part of the MFA, myself and Steve Goodwin and Alan Chews and Beverly Lowry and Dick Bausch were all friends. We hired one another. Uh, Dick was there when I came, um, and then Steve I went to graduate school with, Alan I taught with. This would never happen, it never happen today. We've become much more sophisticated. There are many people to interview, but I think that community that we had helped to grow the community of students that continues and continues with the faculty that we have now, which is a wonderful faculty, very diverse, very diverse in, in all kinds of ways and what they teach and what they write about and who they are. And I think this has opened up our MFA now to a whole new world. 
I, I would agree with you. I, I think that that because you all were friends, you you really did set the tone. And I think that that you know community uh, sense really does you know cut across the program and really does inform the relationship between faculty and among faculty and and with students. Um, and um, I, I think that probably the the growth of the program, even in these trying times, will continue. Um, and I certainly hope so. Um, I'm trying well, to- the Trying forward. times are good for writing programs. Well, yes, exactly. Because trying times are good for writers. Um, because we, you know, we, we, that's when we write our best. Um, I, I know students I'm still in touch with are like, you know, this is not a comfortable time. It's like, well, you know, I don't write well when I'm comfortable. In fact, I tend not to write at all when I'm comfortable because if I get too comfortable within myself, I don't feel like writing. I, you know, go off and do something else. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that how you are and have been through the years. Does that match your experience? Um, I, I, I think yes and no. Uh, I, I started. There was almost a dinner table competition and amongst the members of my family who could tell the best story at dinner. My father always won it, but I tried. Say a bit more. What were your early stories like in those, in those dinner time conversations and competitions? They were what my mother would call lies. They were about what happened to us that day that we made up. And my father and I and my brother did this a lot at dinner. And no, I really did grow up in a storytelling family, not a Southern family, a Midwestern family. I know Southern families are always storytelling families, but there was a little of the Irish tale that went on in my household. Yeah. So I think it was good grounding. I read a lot, but I think it was good grounding for becoming a writer. Right. I, I would also say something else that, that, that you mentioned in terms of writing programs and how people are drawn to them. I do think this whole past century, and certainly the one we're in, we have been trying to figure out ourselves, ourselves in our community, ourselves in the larger world. It's not so easily defined anymore. It could not be less easily defined than it is right now. But I think writing helps put your head together in that way. Answers the questions that you find very difficult to answer. Yeah. Which are, where do I belong? Right, right. Um, you mentioned magazines and, you know, and, and when you talked about magazines kind of sustaining writers historically, I'm reminded of, of the John Cheever story um, where he wanted to, uh, I guess, wanted to take back a story he had sent to his editor at the New Yorker and, and you know, just was so angst ridden about how to do it and, and tried to get it back and ended up going all the way into New York to try to get it back. Um, you know, and so I, I don't think the plot or the lot of, of life of a writer has ever been particularly easy. Um, we look back and think, oh, you know, they had it a lot better than we do, and that may or may not be true, but um, if we could resurrect John, I don't think he'd say it was easy in those days either. No, I don't think it's ever, it's not an easy profession. It's a fun profession if you like to do it. I happen to like to do it, but it's not an easy one, and it's, the world is not necessarily out there with open arms waiting for what it is you have to say. Right. So let me come back to the dinner time. When did you go from telling oral tales to writing them down, which is a, a different level of artifice? I took creative writing in college. Right. That, that was the first time I did. It was not welcome. Any kind of creative writing was not welcome in high school, it was not welcome particularly in grammar school. And I don't think that has much changed. So I took a creative writing course in college and um, and I was not impressive in it, uh, but it was a very good experience for me. And then the second thing I did was work with Peter Taylor and S Steve Goodwin was the uh, sort of Mr. Excellence in that class. And that was at UVA in graduate school. 
I was I was going to come back to that. You you said a couple of times you didn't have a, a an MFA, which is true, but you do have an MA, and you did study with Peter. Peter and, and I Trump. did. So yeah. Um, but today, Steve and I would not be hired at a university without an MFA. Mm -hmm. And right. actually, the president of the university at the time after we started the MFA, when he realized I didn't have one, he said, well, why don't you take your own? And at that point, I was the only teacher in it. And in fact, at that point, you were in my class, Bill. <laughs> I know, I know. Bill's a very good writer. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I took a creative writing class as an undergrad at UNC Chapel Hill. And I wasn't particularly um, outstanding there either. I got a B. I think Peter gave everybody an A. It was <laughs> less troubling. You did yeah. from them later. Which makes me, you know, think that I must have been really bad because I think the tendency is, yeah, that you, you you give them give all the students student hopefuls, you know, A's because it's less troubling and. You know, um, what is it that I think Dick used to say this? He didn't want to be the the writer who gave what some famous writer to be the B that then came back and said, see how wrong you were about me here. I'm writing all these bestsellers and winning all these awards and you gave me a B in your class. <laughs> anyway, I gave out B's when I was teaching, I'll tell you. <laughs> Maybe I was inspired by the instructor I had at UNC Chapel Hill. But let's turn attention to this most recent novel, shall we? Sure. Um, talk about the seeds of it a little bit, if you will. Um, this is, this is um, well, let me, just, let me just throw it out there. Um, I, I, one, I want to say, no, let me not throw it out there. Um, I find this novel to be, um, richly complicated. Um, in part, it's a murder mystery. In part, it's a quest story um, as, as Georgiana seeks the truth of her mother's murder. Um, in part, it's a, it's a very vivid character study because you have created such vivid characters. Um, there's a thing about your work, having watched it over the arc, and one of the things that I've done um, in my career as a writer and student of, of contemporary literature um, is to read the, the sort of lifelong collection of numerous writers. A lot of writers do get to that point, usually about the fourth book or so, where they find their thing and then go on with it, you know? Um, a lot of people talk about Toni Morrison and Beloved, but the one jazz before Beloved is a, is a much more brilliant book than Beloved was. Um, but nobody knows that, you know? And there are lots of writers who's, whose book just before the breakthrough book was, was good. But the thing in writing, in reading all of your writing um, is that there isn't one book where, you know, where everything is, is um, then set forever after. You reinvent yourself as a writer in each one of these novels. And um, your, your editors probably don't appreciate that. But as a reader, as a reader, I certainly appreciate that. And as a writer, um, I, I greatly appreciate what you're doing for expanding your own craft each time you sit down to do one of these novels. Um, so it's, it's with that informedness, if you will, that I ask the question, what's the seeds for this one? The seeds, I, I, this summer I did this funny little exercise is sitting down and writing the seeds for all of the books that I have written. And, um, and it was interesting. I started and I remembered. The seed for this book um, was my grandfather, who I never knew, or my grandmother, um, owned a boys camp in northern Wisconsin. Wisconsin was a place I've never been to, now I have. Um, and I was looking at this picture of them. They were in a canoe. It was bucolic, a beautiful sort of warm picture of a young couple in love in a boat at a boys camp. And by the time I got down to make coffee, 
after looking at this photograph. And I'd never given him much thought. I never met him. He was very important in my mother's life. His wife died very young. He died very young. And um, so I'd never really had any sense of him beyond what my mother said, which was completely adoring. By the time I got down to make coffee, I had a book and the book was about a man who was Jewish and it, the year was 1941 when it began and uh, when it really began. And uh, he um, murdered his wife, who was the daughter of a professor, medical doctor at the University of Michigan. None of these things were true of my grandfather and my grandmother. But suddenly this man that I had never met um, morphed into a murderer, into another time, into a time in which there was tremendous anti-Semitism in the Midwest and he was, he was a Jew uh, and married a wasp. And where all of this came from, I have no idea, but I think that's how books begin. Something starts them, and in this case, it was a photograph, mm -hmm. and they become something you had no idea you had in you to write, because this man, who's, a, who's I think, a likable man, I liked him a lot, uh, who murders his wife. Not everybody who read the book liked him. I thought that was not necessary, but... Um, but I wanted to try it. Well, and you don't really know whether he murdered his wife or not because, but his daughter, he, they had one child and he died in prison. His daughter um, wanted to know when she was grown up and had children of her own and was a widow, she wanted to find out. So she re, um, reenacted their trip he was he was murdered he murdered her at a campsite and she followed that trip took her children along and that was essentially the seeds of the story but these things take funny little paths in your mind as you begin to think about them and then i went through and i did a funny thing which was to count the number of books in which somebody had been murdered and there were way too many for a middle-aged woman to have written. Well, here, in a sense, the murder is is very much a crime of passion. It's a crime of passion. Um, did you do it that way, kind of deliberately, to redeem your 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 father figure character? No, I from the very beginning, um, I thought of him as a good man, and I I. I, you see a lot of him early on, so that he is a good man and a kind man. Uh, and but at the moment, hmm? so, and a very misunderstood man. And a very misunderstood man. And at the time, um, the he's Lithuanian, and at the time of the book, the majority of the action of the book takes place, which is the action that precipitates her, his daughter's trip to the campsite. Um, at that time, the um, Hitler is invading, the Nazis are invading Lithuania and the village where his, he grew up and where his father still is. Right. That, that was so, part of what I, what I had in mind when I talked about the beautiful com complicatedness of this novel, because you set it on the world stage and the backdrop of world events. Um, and you never let the reader lose sight of those world events. You just kept reminding us, and, and you kind of drew those into your central story um, in a way that, that is causal you know, and pivotal to the action of, of your story. So it's, it's microcosmic in terms of the story, but it's against the macrocosm of, of the world. I, yes, it is. And I think that it, I started this book when Obama was president. I finished it when Trump was president. And it was a really interesting thing that happened in this country at that time, because you had a period of time 
in which all levels of thought were possible. Well, and that was to have them. Yeah, and that was what struck me is how timely the novel was, even though set in history. Um, it seems so timely thematically for today. And, um, you know, um, I, I got to hold it up again and say, folks, if you're engaged and you haven't read this book yet, you got you got to order it, click on the link and, and get one. Um, because it is it is so timely um, for today and and in terms of its themes and in terms of in terms of characterization and the way that characters are affected by events, both both that they trigger and that they um, are victimized by, uh, in a sense, you know. Um, I, I do have to say, I saw a little bit of you in in the lead female character, you know. Kim. I have never been an auto, intentionally an autobiographical writer. Someone had said to me, um, why don't you ever write about anybody your own age? Uh, the character of Georgie is close to my own age. And um, I, I've always preferred the ages of my children, whatever right. they were. I spend a lot of time around students and around my children and around their friends. And um, I, I, I get it. Right. Um, I didn't want to get my age quite with quite this much enthusiasm as to make it, I think, the only at least autobiographical book that I have written in terms of feeling. Well, when I said that, what I had, go ahead. No, I, 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 I did think about myself in this particular case. Right. What I was struck by was, um, it's fairly early um, when she's evoked, um, the hair, <laughs> combs, the escaping hair, this was written entirely for my students who saw me putting my combs back in my hair every time they fell, fell out, which was always. I had to chuckle. It was, that was, that was, you know, I could see your tongue firmly implanted in the cheek when you, when you put that in. Um, but then also her desire um, to bring, to bring the family on the trip, for example, you know, family means so much to Georgie and, um, and it seems so symbolic and yet truthful and I think representative of you that she would want to bring the family together and unite the family. Um, and I don't think it gives too much away that to say that, that she does this in retrospect as she goes along at some peril. Um, this is not an easy paddle down the stream, um, literally and figuratively, it, it becomes something else. No, and, and it, I think it, do, it does, and it becomes scary, actually scary. And I had a number of people, women in particular, um, closer to my age, who said really how selfish of her to have done that. And of course, in part, it was selfish. In part, the things you take your children through that they have not chosen to go through is selfish. But, but I would have done it myself. <laughs> Well, and that's because, I mean, as long as I've known you, um, and in the many, many ways I've known you, family has always been important to you. Um, and, and I think always will be, you know, um, in your life and in your work, I think family is important to you. Right, and I do think that the one thing that does, my work does have in common is that I, um, that I generally write about families. Right, I mean, um, I was going to say, I think if there is a thematic uh, constancy or continuity within your work, it is family as a theme. Um, Miracle Play, for example, um, which, which if, you know, if there is a book that sort of established a wide reading audience for you, I think it was Miracle Play, um, which was, if I remember correctly, a book that you had a grant to sort of step back from your teaching load and finish. Um, and I feel like it sort of allowed you focus um, that some of the previous books had not allowed because you were doing two or three other things, teaching your load and, and doing leadership positions in the, in the writerly community and that kind of thing. Um, 
but again, that was about a family, um, and and family was very central to to that book, um, essentially right there. Um, yeah, it was the family. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because, uh, I mean, one of the things, I'm from a very tiny family, and somehow everybody seemed to die young, and um, of the generation above my parents, uh, they were all there, and then they were gone, and so I think I was building the family I didn't have, both in fact, because I have four children, but I was building it in uh, writing. It was good company. When you think about it, um, do you see any kind of um, constancy in terms of the family theme? I mean, um, for example, as I think back over the arc of all your works, I think about families threatened frequently being one of the, one of the centerpieces. Mm -hmm. it, I think it is. I think it is. And it's probably, you know, we, we are much more likely to write our worst nightmares than we are to write our highest dreams. Um, <laughs> my students are always like saying, well, why can't we write about happy times? And, and of course, I do the parody of Karenina, Anna Karenina, you know, all happy families are alike. Therefore, we don't write about them. Uh, we write about the unhappy families and the unhappy times. Um, is that why you write about families threatened, or do you actually sort of? Um, I think we're, I, I, it, it, it's the John Irving in me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's the danger lurking right outside. I was told uh, there is one thing that I am conscious of doing. I very seldom leave a book dark. Mm. There's plenty of darkness, but I very se seldom leave a book dark. And I was told by this old salty journalist after my first novel, he said, that book was okay, but there are no happy endings. And I thought a lot about that. And I thought, well, if there aren't, you can make them so. Right. Was it Ann Tyler at dinner in the homesick dinner at the homesick restaurant where she had the woman who had a, one child and then had two others and realized that all she'd done is is triple her chances of sadness and loss? Right. Yeah. Um, so what are you working on now? I'm working on children's books. I also write children's books. I love to write children's books. And I'm having uh, this strange, I have a lot of grandchildren. And so it seemed to me I um, should be working on children's books. But I have some writing grandchildren as well. And one of them this summer, um, we all sort of wrote alongside the, these little girls all wrote alongside me writing in this cabin where I write. And um, one of my grandchildren uh, decided that it would be helpful if she edited uh, the book I was writing after I left the cabin. And so I left the cabin and went back the next day and the book on the computer was not quite the same book I'd left on the computer. It was greatly edited. So it's been interesting because I thought, well, she was reading that book and she thought it, there are a lot of problems with it. Maybe I've lost my voice for children. I can't believe that. You've done how many? <laughs> I mean, you've got 26 adult novels and how many and how many uh, children's books? Now? I have 16 adult no novels. One is a memoir, but I've written 30 children's books, but I haven't for a while, and the last three or four didn't do particularly well. Um, and now my editor, who was Harry Potter's editor, has opened up his own shop, and it's a diversity shop. And um, I asked him, could I provide age as a diversity? Hmm. And I don't think it's going to fly. Um. Well, we have, uh, we actually have audience members, um, at least, at least one, um, Grace Kwan, who is an alum. I'm sure you remember Grace. Um, Grace Kwan so we, was my little discovery. Yeah, we will send a shout out to Grace. She has, she has written a question. 
Um, what's something you always wanted to write about, but have not? That's a really interesting question. That's Grace. Um, I would love to write a real love story. America doesn't have many love stories. Um, and the closest I ever got uh, was a book called The Train Home. Yeah. It's not really a love story. It's the suggestion of a love story. But I'd love to be able to write that. And love stories are hard to write. I always saw the train home as a as a as a wonderfully rich allegory. It it was that's what it became more yeah. was an allegory than a love story. I, I think you get to be angry that critics didn't get that book as well as they should have. They didn't, um, and it, it, no, the critics didn't get it. Didn't sell particularly well, um, and I still love it. Me too. Um, another alum, Aram Han, writes, who are the authors you're most excited about right now? Well, you know, I'm reading authors um, right now that I have not, uh, that are new new writers, because I think, I think we're in an interesting, um, a little bit throw the spaghetti against the wall time as far as writing is concerned. It's very different. It's very um, open-ended and it's very diverse. And so to say one particular person, um, one of the things that I have planned for this year is I'm about to take a course in Ulysses. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going forward, I'm going back. But I think that there's something to be said for going back when you haven't for a long time because I've spent the last however many years, 45 years at George Mason, teaching a lot of contemporary fiction. And uh, so I think that at this particular moment, I'm excited about Joyce. Yeah. Um, well, when you talk about diversity, uh, I would just elaborate a little bit on that. I mean, not only is there race and gender diversity in ways that there hasn't been before, but there also is aesthetic and stylistic oh. diversity. Yeah, it is. And, and there's some amazing books right. um, that are being, being written. And another thing that's happened that was not true of my generation, which was really brought up on the classics, uh, is that because of all this reading of contemporary fiction, all of you have been doing, all of the creative writers have been doing, um, there's a lot of exper experiment, there's a lot of um, daring that is going on. Um, and there's a lot of, of melting of fiction into nonfiction. Um, it's an interesting moment in writing. It is. Lots of doors are open. Um, and we're actually getting some, uh, some uh, discussion going here. I've got another question that's been sent to me. Um, why do you think love stories are hard to write? That's a really good question. Um, I think love stories in life are hard to have. I, I think so much of um, so much is, is the beginning of things, but then they have to move to some sort of end. And that is difficult to move something that's wondrous at the beginning to an end that has its own sense of wonder. And I also think um, we're such a culture of what's next, what's coming up. Yeah. I, I won't bore people by talking about my own writing, but, but that is something I'm playing with in a short story that I think could be the first of a connected series of stories um, and make a book. Um, On uh, love stories. What? A love stories. Well, not so much that, but it, it's this couple, and they're 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 both in a group therapy setting, and um, this guy is there because his mother has died just recently before this, and he feels very guilty about her death because he didn't see her enough, and he feels responsible for it, and he reaches out to a woman who's in the group, um, and she tries to help him, um, but they don't really fall in love so much as they fall in need for each other. 
So you could follow that, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, Lena Patton writes a question. Uh, what surprised you most during the process of writing this book? Lena, are you in Germany? We'll have to, she can't answer. So oh, we'll she have can't to. answer, of course. Um, what surprised me most about writing this book is that it worked. I really do feel it worked. Books don't always work. Looking back on books, some I would like to have a hand at again, um, but this worked and it seemed impossible in so many ways to work. But the other thing that pleased me about this is that we're at a time and it's an important time and I totally believe it, in which the words you hear in universities and all over the place is that you cannot appropriate another culture. And this book um, is a love affair between, it is a very quiet love affair, which is to say there's, there's not much shown about it until the very end uh, between a black man and a white man, white woman. Right. And that nobody ever mentioned it to me. I thought, wow, I can hardly open my mouth in class without somebody saying something, some line I've crossed. This really surprised me, and it was as though they had not noticed. They had noticed the the attraction, the connection, but not not the color. Right. Well, I noticed. Pleased. I noticed it. Go, you go ahead. No, you know, it just pleased me because yeah, yeah. I think everything that has been it, it, our sense of language now and how it applies to us and how it applies to others is being called. A call of attention to right and i think it's really important and at the same time um i was extremely pleased not to hear a lot about this hmm. well i saw it as as pivotal and I, and I didn't think the race mattered so much as the attraction did mm -hmm. um but of course the the uh, the race mattered in the context of that time period and the barriers to fulfillment of the connection. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I sometimes get accused in doing these things of giving away too much in the, in the plot line of a story. So I, I wasn't going to get into that, but I think it's, it's essentially pivotal to the redemption um, and the redemptive aspects of the story mm -hmm. that we're telling. Um, and yes, we got a response. Lena is in Germany. <laughs> Um, uh, Priyanka uh, writes, is there something in your writing process that has remained the same since you first started and what has changed that you wished you'd tried earlier? Good craft question. You know, it, it, it is Priyanka. Priyanka has written an absolutely beautiful book that is coming out. I am eager, all, eager writing that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, it, 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 it won a prize. It's coming out this winter and it's gorgeous. Um, I, I think that, I think in terms of craft, uh, I've become more and more conscious of language. I was much more conscious of story in the beginning. And then I became aware that uh, I wanted to be a better writer. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of craft, I honestly think I probably learned more from teaching than I did from writing books. You do have a wonderful um, craft with, with language. Um, the rhythm of sentences, you know, John Gardner and the whole thing about, about um, in, in the elements of fiction and, and those books that he did talks about like line editing and doing the, the accents and like you were doing poetry. Um, and, and I don't, I don't know that I'd advise that because it would probably, you know, turn off too many people. Of course, that might be good cut down on competition when I send my stuff out. But at the same time, the rhythm of your sentences they move forward at a, and oftentimes at a kind of clipped pace, but at the same time, they move the story forward in, in interesting ways, you know? 
Um, and I think it's because of the, the rhythm of the sentences that it kind of provides the force and the energy that moves the reader through the story. Um, I think that's as close as I um, come to understanding music. Uh, um, and I think that I have in, in my ear, and I don't know what whether I know I have a son who's a writer. He he often straightens out my sentences because he recognizes their crookedness. But I think that I have, over the course of time, um, become more conscious of the word in the sentence than I was earlier. But I do have a rhythm in my ear yes. for the kind of sentences that I write, which is is very hard for children's book editors to buy into mm -hmm. because these books are for children who should learn how to uh, read consecutively right. and uh, they are not necessarily consecutive. Uh, another alum, Mary Marcakis, uh, writes, um, and that's both of us, but I'm going to let you mostly, does writing energize or exhaust you or both? Me? Yeah. Energizes. I, I am, uh, I think, probably in a rare group, which may, may say more terrible things about me as a writer than good ones, but I love writing. I feel wonderful after I've written, and I don't despair when what I've written is not very good. I just go back. So I'm a happy writer. There are an awful lot of beautiful writers who are unhappy writers. Yeah, the um, I, I'm much the same way. I know there are writers who who you know hate writing but love having written. I love the process, drafting, editing, revising. I just love the process. Um, and like you, I don't, you know, if it's not particularly good and I know it's not particularly good, that doesn't particularly bother me. Um, cause I figure tomorrow's another day. Mm -hmm. Now, if I get a rejection, that's a whole nother thing. Liam Callanan. Hello, Liam has written. Hi, Liam. Um, I missed you when I went to your, to your state. Yeah. How has teaching informed your writing and vice versa? You made mention of this a few moments ago, um, but, but circle back to it, if you will. Talk about teaching and writing. Well, you, first of all, you have to think about it. You have to think about communicating clearly what it is you're trying to say about someone's work. And it's a little bit what the workshop does. I mean, I have a love-hate relationship with workshops. I'm much happier to be on the side of the desk that I've spent at George Mason. I have often told the story that when I was handing in um, short stories, which I don't write, but I did write them for class with Peter Taylor, I would not go to the class when the criticism was given um, because I didn't want to hear it. I asked Steve Goodwin to copy down everything that God said and tell me later. Uh, but Did teaching Peter has Peter taught you, me. Peter let you get away with that? Um, yes. He probably was just as happy to have Steve take that news back. <laughs> it was not always good news. Um, but I do think that teaching has made me very, very conscious of things. I might not otherwise have been conscious of. Um, you don't have a lot of eyes on your work. Yeah. But with this, in a classroom, you do. In right. looking at the work of others, you have eyes on your own work. I find that teaching really helped my inventiveness um, because the student comes in and says, I don't know how to do this, and I start you know, ideally in some sort of Socratic method to lead them to figure out how to do what it is they're trying to do. But I'm also kind of going through it in my own imagination. So, so I get the benefit of that. And it's not a story I would ever write. Um, you know, Martians landing on Earth or whatever it is, oftentimes with the students, it's as alien to me as, you know, anything could be. But just the process of invention um, is just is just rewarding in, in itself. And it kept my 
my juices flowing for all the for all the times um, that I could then sit down and, and write. So I got a lot out of it from that regard. And I learned from my students um, as well. You know, they turn a phrase and you go, damn, that's good. You know? Um, Danielle Harms, Susan, you've often spoken about the narrative power of a turn in fiction when the story opens up into something new. Did you find the turn for this book in your first draft or did it need more attention and revision? I found the actual turn um, in the first draft, but the book certainly needed a lot of revision to lead up to it. So it was the beginning of the book that I really revised a great deal in order to earn the turn, more or less. Would it be too revealing of the plot line to ask where that turn where is for you? The turn there, um, the, the, the actual turn is, is reaching the river, when they reach the river. Right. Which really begins the quest. Which um, begins the quest. And my problem at the beginning was who's in charge? And it took me a long time to come to Georgie being in charge. I didn't want a 70 year old woman necessarily as my protagonist. I, I wanted another younger protagonist, much as I wanted a younger self. And, um, and I kept sort of, uh, scrambling around with that. And when the turn came, it was clearly Georgie's story. Right. Uh, Nora Walter writes, uh, Susan, you mentioned that writing can be a fun profession and that you have fun writing. How do you keep the process fun after so many novels? 16 years. It was a new novel. I mean, it, it has always seemed to me that the greatest wonder about writing is you can sit down and make up what you are going to do that day. And so the idea of being able to make up something new, um, start all over again, is pretty thrilling. Right. Um, I hope I'll have the good sense to stop when I'm done. That's, that's the danger. I, I think you will, but I don't know when I could imagine that time coming. Um, on the other hand, we talked about family uh, theme as a kind of constant in your work. Um, um, but on, at the same time, we also talked about how each book is a little bit different. Um, and a lot of writers tend to go to the same kind of themes, the same kind of uh, ideas, some of the same plot lines or some of the same discoveries they've made before because they can't totally reinvent themselves as writers each time. Um, but you, I think, um, from conversations we've had through the years, you're, spe you're uh, spinning your stories out of where you are in life and where life seems to be around you. Um, and I think because you, because you are combining an extrapolatory process, if that's a word, um, you're extrapolating from the world as well as from your own self and you're blending those together. I think that process of that synthesization is, must be fun for you. It is fun. And it is also a way of, it's not that I always write contemporary novels, but it's also a way of um, having, I, I'm very interested and not particularly proficient in history, but I'm very interested in history and the way the history of one's time or the history of a generation affects that generation, the, all the people in that generation. And so uh, that part of uh, that part of writing, I find very attractive and inventing a world is attractive. And, and I, it, it, it means that I have to learn some things that I might not otherwise learn. Right, right now, for example, I've been thinking about all the research I did uh, in the flu the pandemic of 1918, which was a lot of research uh, for like two pages. But I remember the research. I remember what was happening. And so that in, in part, there's a, a, a thrill about that. 
it's a kind of a new thrill. Well, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's what we learn, right? That kind of keeps us going. And that's why right. I, well, a few moments ago, I said, I, I couldn't envision you coming to that point where you, you know, where, where you say, okay, I'm done. I've written everything I have to write because you're, you're still exploring, you're still learning. Um, and there are things, many things still to know and to learn about. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and um, we're probably- and I'm glad you're still writing. I think that's a statement of, uh, about coming to an MFA program. You came as a journalist, um, coming to an MFA program and making it work in all kinds of ways. You were our director for many years and um, you, you had all parts of this business. And it was fun. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, Steve Goodwin, who we have mentioned, um, um, and so therefore made a kind of invisible cameo appearance in our discussion, um, has written a kind of um, tribute. It's not a question, but um, I'm going to, um, as, our, as a bit of our closing, I'm going to um, read this, if you don't mind. Susan has been making communities, families her whole life, and she did it at Mason. How many of us did she introduce to the larger literary community? Not really a question, but this was a major force at Mason. Thanks, Steve. Um, I should say Steve is himself setting up for retirement. Um, right. Yeah, so um, a lot of us um, faces will be changing, um, which is good because, you know, times are changing as we've talked about and um, we and they're great people that we leave behind yep. and, um, and, and it's, I, I will say this, it's a very organized program. Once some of the wild, wild ones stepped back a bit. Yeah. Um, so I think that's it, unless there's something you want to say that, that um, we have a couple of moments and then we got to get out of here. As I, I want to thank my students, I, all of our students. Uh, it's been, Steve and I, as you can imagine, you always complain about your job and there, we had our times of complaining about our jobs. And basically, what could have been more fun, you guys? Students have always made a big difference. I think at both the undergrad and grad levels at Mason and my work with them. Um, they have really been the keys to, to everything that I tried to do, um, both as a motivator for doing them and as a reason for sort of, you know, getting into that office every day and making sure that, that things were working for them and, and for faculty and, um, you know, I'm trying to, trying to make things happen. I agree. So I guess that's it. And um, we'll give the technique, the, the whole technology thing here back to the people. Um, and to those of you who, who tuned in, uh, whatever, or logged on or whatever the right word is, thank you all very much for doing so. Um, thank you very much, actually. And um, have a good day. And thank you, Bill. It was, it was really wonderful. It, it was fun, yeah. Great fun. Great fun.